called the uh, strategic planning, planning meeting for the Board of County Commissioners to order for uh, Monday, October 5th. Let the record reflect that all three commissioners are present. And the uh, first order of business is Mr. Hubert. Welcome. Good afternoon. How are you, Commissioner? Living the dream. <laughs> Good for you. You're um, up. I'm up. What I've got before the board uh, on, on the agenda for tomorrow's vote, I believe, <clears throat> is uh, possibly two things. The first of which is uh, an amendment or an addendum, if you will, to the uh, hearing examiner uh, procedural rules. Uh, there it is. Look at that. Um, we are now in a position in the hearing examiner's office and uh, building and planning department to conduct uh, land use hearings over the internet using the Zoom platform. Um, in doing that, I needed to rethink some of the protocols and uh, rules for submitting uh, exhibits and evidence and so forth to the hearing examiner during the hearings. Uh, the reason for that is that at an in-person hearing, quite often uh, the applicant and sometimes even some of the citizens who are testifying will bring with them uh, documents or, or materials that they want me to consider and put into the record. And they want to use those as exhibits so that everybody, we usually put it up on the screen there in the commissioner's room. Uh, and uh, the purpose for that is for everybody there to be able to see and, and understand what we're talking about when we're discussing an exhibit. When we do this over the internet, we won't have the ability for people to hand me a document. Um, so I've worked out some rules to allow people to submit uh, documents and materials that they'd like to use as exhibits. Uh, they would submit those ahead of time in digital form and just as we're doing right now, screen sharing this uh, resolution on the screen, uh, during the hearing when a witness wants to talk about an exhibit, the, my, my assistant Kevin Ruiz will be able to put that document up on the screen so everybody participating in the meeting could see it, we could talk about it, and I can make it part of the record. Um, there's some other housekeeping rules that I have in the proposed rules. Uh, simply suggesting to people that uh, only one person should talk at a time, uh, kind of some etiquette and courtesy rules, if you will. That is the thrust of the procedural rules that I wanted to add to the hearing examiner rules. Uh, the reason I'm bringing this to the board for the board of, board's adoption is that uh, the ordinance that establishes the hearing examiner office and uh, also the ordinance that adopted the hearing examiner procedural rules initially says that any revisions or uh, changes to the rules must be adopted by the board. Um, and uh, I felt that this is a change to the rules. It's not merely a, a, a protocol or a, a request by the hearing examiner. Uh, I felt that it, it should carry the weight of a rule uh, so that everybody understands that it'll be available to the public uh, and, uh, and then we'll be able to proceed with our, our hearings. We have a hearing set for the 28th of October, I believe already, that we intend to be our, our first internet-based hearing. So that's in a nutshell um, what the rules are for and why I'm bringing them to the board. I'd be happy to entertain any questions that the board has. Okay, any questions either Mary or Josh? No, I'm good. Sounds good. Looks like we're good. Wonderful board, I appreciate that. Now there might be a, another matter coming up on the board's, uh, on the board's agenda tomorrow for vote and that is the uh, 2020 interlocal agreement with Pondere County for hearing examiner services in Pondere County. Um, we had that contract ready to go um, in draft form back in March earlier this year and uh, COVID kind of put a stop to 
uh, are being able to move forward and with that. But now the board's meeting and I've got my, uh, got my organization back up and so forth. And uh, I believe that contract is gonna be, if the board hasn't already seen it and adopted it, um, I believe that's on the agenda also for tomorrow afternoon. Uh, the only change to that contract, that interlocal agreement, is that we've added a clause that will let this agreement automatically renew every year. Uh, the first draft or first, first agreement was only for a year so that Pondere could make sure that they uh, liked what I was doing and, and wanted us to continue. Uh, they've told me that they are happy with the service. They want to continue. They've signed the, uh, signed the uh, interlocal agreement that should be before the board tomorrow. And uh, it's just waiting now for the board signature. Okay. Any questions or ideas on our agenda for tomorrow? So we should be uh, able to dispense of that then. Excellent. Very good. Okay. Well, those are the only things I have, Commissioners. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. David, real quick, I'm sorry. How many cases do you know in the last year, a couple of years, did? Uh, the hearing examiner here for Ponderet? Because I know we've had the contract in place. I believe we had 10 or 12 hearings in Ponderet County in, uh, in the year 2019. Uh, typically, because, because when we have hearings, or before now, when we had hearings in Ponderet County, I actually went up to Newport yeah. to hold those hearings. And so we would schedule three and sometimes four hearings in the same day. Um, so I was only up there about three or four times, but we did, I think we had 10 or even 12 hearings that we heard last year. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Very good, thanks Dave. Thank you, I'll be leaving the meeting then. Okay, uh, next item uh, is Mark McLean, who's joining us to talk about CPACER and their progress. Uh, I met with Commissioner uh, Kinney for a brief period of time, and we talked about, uh, I think, needing to maybe talk a little further with a couple of other individuals, a banker and a, uh, maybe a realtor, just to see what this might do with our local, um, I don't know, real estate, what other things might encumber the property if we do this. It still is gonna require the county to, if we want to move forward with this, to establish uniform criteria to determine when a project creates a public benefit. That'll be, a, I think, an interesting thing to figure out how we do that and how, because the, the statute requires us to do that. The proponent of this suggests that, well, no, anyone can just look at this and if the papers are in the file that it, it did that benefit. And I don't think that when the legislature tells us we have to decide if there's a benefit that we can just go, there's a piece of paper there, that must mean there is a benefit. So it's gonna require someone to a criteria for which someone can evaluate that against. Now, obviously, if, if someone does a seismic retrofit to a building, there's a, there's a benefit. Um, but some of this is new construction. So let's say they utilize a different type of electricity or different types of you know, LED lighting or some other thing. Um, if it's new construction, how, how are you gonna decide if there's an actual benefit there? Um, or when we do reconstruction, you know, that's, that's usually pretty straightforward. Um, but some of this does require uh, a weight and measure so that's kind of where we are, I think, at this point. And then there's some other things. Um, you know, what happens when the state creates this program? Are we, we, we obviously, the statute requires us to utilize certain portions of this, even if we create our own, uh, utilize certain portions for, that the state adopts, um, forms in particular. Um, so the, I don't know how it will morph over time, but that's kind of where we are. So I, I still don't know necessarily if this is really something the county wants to move forward with. Um, or if we've now pointed out that commerce is working on this, that we let them do this and then adopt our own based on commerce. I just really don't have a sense of where the county wants to go. I think right now we're still, we're still discovering. Okay. Mary, any comments that you had? Um, no, that, that Mark and I, we had a good conversation and that, yeah, I mean, but I, I think, you know, cause Gordon was one of the ones that, uh, had come and talked to us, but I'd like to, you know, maybe have Mark and Gordon and I and maybe try to get, you know, a lender. Um, you know, I, I don't know if Jack Heath would be available or not, but just to see what they're seeing and feeling from their side. 
Um, I think that's that's the piece that's kind of missing in all this is where's where's the commercial lenders on this? Okay. Josh, any thoughts from your standpoint? No, again, I mean, same same kind of concerns I had the last time we talked about this. I mean, it just seems like there, there's much more to this program than uh, than I was initially led to believe. So, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't. I mean, it, it, it certainly sounds like we have a few more questions we need to flesh out first, but. Yeah, go ahead, Mary. And I was gonna say, and I guess for me, I, I'm not in any hurry to deal with this. You know, there's a few other things going on, but uh, uh, unless someone feels like we need to do this ASAP, um, I don't think we need to. So, um, like I said, happy to try to have that, get that group together, you know, but, uh, it may be a, a month. Okay. The, uh, I mean, when I when I talked to him and stuff, it was the the there wasn't a lot of time spent about the public benefit side of it, but uh, the the upgrading of buildings is a, obviously a public benefit. Uh, uh, reduce or improving energy efficiency is a public benefit. And I mean, there's a there's a number of things that you can throw at this that could uh, qualify for that. It's got to be more, I agree, more than a piece of paper in a file. It has to be substantive. But uh, yeah, if this is getting uh, much more involved than I was led to believe, uh, the county would be into this thing and stuff. So, um, you know, I guess do some more dil due diligence on it and then bring it back when you think it's right. Okay, we'll do. One of the concerns I clearly had that I think that needs to be circling in, in your, your heads about this is if we, we move forward is, so, because the way this works is you, you know, you, you get this loan, but you can't for, ultimately foreclose on this loan until it actually reaches full maturity. You can foreclose on it a year at a time uh, if you want, but it, it's not even a full foreclosure. It's just a foreclosure on the portion that is, is in arrears which I don't know what that does with the market. What do you do when you have a building that has a, you know, that has these weird encumbrances on it? So yes, the building got a huge benefit, but the county now maybe has a piece of property that's encumbered that's gonna be odd to figure out how to foreclose. I mean, I just don't know. I can't see far enough down the road to help yeah. well with that, but I, those are the concerns I have about this move as we, you know, address this. So those might be issues for an assessor to trying to assess the value going down there, do you think? It's certainly going to create a wrinkle for the assessor that I hadn't even considered is whether that would create an increase in value or a decrease in value if they had this particular loan. I can't ima imagine it'd be negligible. Well, I would think you might have a big increase at first, and then if it's not paid, a big decrease. Oh, yeah. But if the, if the building has in, uh, undergone some kind of improvement, the market value of the building should reflect whatever the dollar investment is of that improvement. I mean, that's one of the reasons you get a building permit is to help define what the, the dollar amount is of that improvement. So regardless of how you financed it, the improvement's still there. So whether you yeah. paid for it out of your pocket or paid for it with a loan or this, the improvement's still there. So from an assessed valuation, I don't know how it would be. Financing doesn't assess the impact assessed valuation. No, but I'm thinking it, it would if it's more valuable, it's going to be assessed more highly, obviously. Yeah, but that's going to be a nature of the improvement, not a yeah. nature of the loan. Right. I mean, the only, the only negative I can see is, like you said, if the loan becomes a challenge in terms of how to administer and or an encumbrance that is unclear, that could have a negative impact on the value of the building because as an investor, I wouldn't want to invest in something that's got a cloud over it. That's right. exactly it. And Unless it's you discounted can. heavily. And since you can't want, just wipe it out, yeah, with a foreclosure, it's a weird, it's a weird tool. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> now they, right. they assert that there ne has never been a foreclosure on this, but I just wonder if part of that is because it's so awkward to do it. Do it. Do. Yeah. 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 I never jumped off the cliff because I wasn't sure what was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. All right. So I, as I understand this, I, this is more low priority, but continue to move forward and certainly work with the commissioner and work with the others, but. Just keep it moving, but don't make it a high priority. Is that 
what my yeah, emergency that's would be. my my sense. What do you think? I see Mary shaking her head. Josh, what do you think? I can't see your head. Yeah, yeah. No, I I agree. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. So, Thank you. go forth, but not with great haste. All right. I'll see well, you here at, at this point, we're 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 ahead of schedule because we were supposed to talk until two forty-five, and it's only two fifteen now. So uh, might as well just hang around. We'll probably go in these extra possession pretty darn quick here. Uh, That's just a sign of a well-run meeting, Commissioner. Well, very good, Commissioner Curry. Very, very efficient. I'm so glad that you've recognized that. No, <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I think I just got smoke. I don't know. Uh, so, Jerry, it's you. Well, Todd was supposed to be here, and I told him to be here at 2.45. Yeah. Can you want me to call him? Which, yes, which is, we are really efficient. It won't take us long to get through our issue, though. So okay. It's a proposed policy change. Well, while uh, uh, Todd is running over here, uh, any miscellaneous matters for either one of, one of you two? Mary? Um, I just want to, I booked flights today. So um, as a civic leader for AETC, we're doing a civic uh, leader meeting uh, the 19th through the 23rd. It's actually the 20th through the 23rd. So I'll be down in Biloxi, Mississippi um, that week. I'll, I think I leave like at 1130 on that Monday so I can be in for part of the meeting on Monday and then I will be able to call in on that Tuesday to the two o'clock um, if need be. But anyway, just, just letting you know that that's going to be kind of a little crazy week. Okay. Okay, anything else? And then Gary, I don't know where we're at on the budget discussion, so that's where I'm concerned. Uh, what component of the budgets would you like to know? <laughs> just just when we're actually going to start talking about the budget? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're, we're still in the process of putting it together and uh, we're going through the nuances of, of correcting errors still, so we don't have a, a complete tabulation and a roll up as of yet. Um, okay. So I can't, keep, you know, I, all I can do is tell you we'll, we'll have it ready for the 13th, and as, if we have it ready before then, I'll certainly uh, shotgun it out to you. And it'll be about the same timing as I'll have ready and available for you the nine month year to date financials for the general fund, too. Okay. Um, okay. I wish, I wish we were further ahead, but that's. Growing pains. Yeah, but I, I get it. Like I said, I just sometimes I'm going to be missing some of those meetings that that week of the 19th. I just was you know, concerned. So thank you. So as a as a preview for next Tuesday, are you can you project whether we are going to have an oh dear God meeting, or are we going to have oh dear God meeting? <laughs> well, it depends on what you consider to be oh dear God. <laughs> if, you're, if your latitude for materiality is this wide, you probably won't be concerned. If it's this wide, then probably. Probably. Yeah. yeah. And, and I don't know what you're used to in the past, but um, what, what usually happens in the initial roll up and the tabulation is you're usually out of balance. There's no, no doubt about it, because these are just the initial submissions from the departments without a lot of scrutiny other than oh, from a mathematical that point of view that they balance. So, so um, you know, as you well know, the departments can ask for anything and everything that they want, but that doesn't mean you're going to give that to them. But right. so this is their first cut and the first request. Okay. I have a miscellaneous. And Mr. Gimmel. We talked earlier today with with the Better Help uh, Health together and a, and a bunch of folks about the Broadband Action um, Planning Committee Partner Questionnaire. And one of the questions that are going to come up is the county obviously is going to participate, but they're going to want to lead contact from the county. And this is going to involve more groups than just, for instance, uh, uh, Catherine's group. And you're going to have you know, infrastructure issues and everything else. And just, I don't know if you thought about who our contact should be, or if you have a preference about who that contact, so I can fill the questionnaire. At first blush, if you, if it, if 
if you, I would recommend we use Arian mm -hmm. as our contact person for that for that group. Is, is that a would that be okay with the other commissioners? It's fine with me. Mary, would that be okay with you? Okay. All right. Thanks. Well, I'll get that filled out and send it in then. Okay, so we have now We're very been... efficient, Todd. We're just blowing through these <laughs> things, I'm telling you. <laughs> I'll never get caught up. <laughs> Don't kill the messenger. <laughs> yeah, we actually dealt with your issue on Friday. <laughs> oh, <so. laughs> oh, we thought we'd let you know. <laughs> what we came up with. Yeah, go ahead. We haven't briefed the board yet. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Good to see you again. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Um, so uh, this afternoon, I'm bringing a, a, a different request, not a CARES Act request. So I get a little bit of a, a reprieve. <laughs> um, uh, this one is um, taking a look at our current staffing position uh, for the Sheriff's Office. We're currently down about 25 commission officers. We have been trying to think outside the box with regard to um, recruiting. Uh, there is a distinct difference, though, in who we recruit. Um, on one hand, we can recruit laterals uh, who are already commissioned peace officers in the state of Washington or uh, commissioned in another state. Um, they come with that a certain amount of uh, advantages. Number one, they've already chosen the profession. They've been working in the profession. So, um, so it's not an issue of whether or not this is the right profession or not. They're simply trying to figure out which agency they want to work for. Um, that's compared to a new recruit who's trying on the profession. Um, we typically hire them if we can get them into training right away. It's about a 10 week, in, excuse me, a 10 month endeavor. Uh, during that time, we pay salary and benefits. We pay for their training costs. We give them per diem when they're in training. Uh, it's about 20 weeks uh, over at the Law Enforcement Academy on Burien. And then they come back and they're in a field training car for the balance of that. Oftentimes we are experiencing that they are eight months plus into a 10 month training program and decide that this is not the profession they wanna go into after we've invested a fair amount in salary benefits and training. Um, so we're trying to change that up a little bit. Uh, and so when we compare a new entry to the profession to a lateral, um, a lateral if they are commissioned in the state of Washington can begin immediately. Um, we do about two weeks of, of work in the training car just to make sure what their, um, their skill sets are, make sure that they're familiar with our policies. But other than that, they are uh, then eligible to work independently in our community. Again, a new recruit is 10 months out before they can work independently as well. Right now, we have a unique dynamic going on in the Northwest, well, actually uh, throughout the nation, and that is, uh, there are a number of agencies who are seeing a um, significant reduction in revenue, sales tax revenue specifically due to COVID. And so those municipalities and those jurisdictions, let me just make sure my ringer's off, I'm sorry. Um, uh, those jurisdictions are finding a shortfall in revenues and are adjusting and lowering their employment levels in a number of jurisdictions. I've lost sound from you guys. Okay. There we are. No, you're back now. I'm back. I'm not sure where I cut off. Um, basically, unique situation, unique set of circumstances where due to COVID, a number of municipalities are seeing a reduction in sales tax revenues and are having to adjust budgets accordingly. Uh, likewise, and you guys all know law enforcement, criminal justice tends to be the largest cost for uh, municipal jurisdictions. And so if you're going to cut, they're going to be impacted. <coughs> in addition to that, we have coupled uh, kind of the current, I will say, um, trends um, with regard to uh, defunding law enforcement and some cities are more likely to entertain those thoughts than others. So that's also had a profound impact on whether law enforcement officers want to continue working in the agency that they're currently in. So that's the unique opportunity is we are in a situation where we have more already commissioned law enforcement officers that are potentially seeking other opportunities than perhaps any time before. And we think this is a unique opportunity to fill the current void that we have, as well as um, address the retention issue by getting people who've already chosen the profession and um, have stayed with the profession. And finally, we're getting people 
who just frankly have more street experience in the profession. So they've seen more challenging situations. They're um, more apt to figure out how to deal with them because of that experience. And so all around, I think a better candidate for us to be able to recruit. Financially, we think the difference between a fresh recruit and a lateral recruit is more than $40,000 per position uh, to be able to do this. Oftentimes we compete against cities for these laterals and cities tend to pay more than counties. And so we try to make the, um, the offer a little bit more attractive. We do that because of the quality of life that we have in this region. There are a number of people who are trying to escape Central Puget Sound uh, and be able to come here for family reasons and professional reasons. Uh, and uh, the other thing that we do have is we have the take home cars and we also have a very diverse agency that gives them opportunities to work in specialties. They may not have the ability to work in other areas. So based on all of that, uh, we wanna make an extra concerted push to recruit laterals to fill these positions. We believe one way to do that is to review our current sign on bonus policy for Spokane County. Um, and I've, I've forwarded a copy of the policy to you, um, as well as the request. I've shared that information with Jerry and with Tim previously. Um, so I wanna make sure you guys have that. We did do just a small sampling of what other jurisdictions are doing um, with regard to uh, what their current sign-on bonuses are. Um, and hopefully you've, you've had a chance to take a quick look at those. Uh, and so that's where we're at today. Uh, the current policy says up to $3,000. I, um, I wanna emphasize that it's an up to because you're not going to offer the same bonus to somebody that has kind of the lower end of experience than somebody that's got a higher end of experience and certifications. Um, and so this would, the request by the sheriff is to change the policy to make it up to $10,000. Okay, and Jerry, I'm sorry. I, I can't find my email that Tim sent me, but there was also, HR was doing some background about what some of our surrounding, like Kootenai County, I believe is $5,000 and uh, King County was $10,000. That when I had this discussion originally about the bonus, it's obviously the board's decision. I said that I would be supportive up to $7,500. And the reason that I didn't go or agree completely with the 10 is we don't know what we don't know. We don't know $3,000 apparently isn't the magic figure to get everybody filled, but you don't know if it's 5,000 or 7,500 or 10,000. So my thought was you try 7,500 up to 7,500, see what happens. If it's not working very well, then we reload again. Every dollar the sheriff department saves, every dollar the sheriff department saves in this budget time is a bonus. Okay. Uh, Mary, let me get Mark and then I'll come to you, okay? I okay. just had one thing because we're, we're involved in another aspect of the, the Sheriff's Office relative to training that I wanted to let you know. I don't know if you're aware of this already, but it looks like CJTC is also going to be reducing the number of offerings yeah. that are available. So that's gonna slow the pipeline for you. It's gonna slow it too. It is. Mary? Um, so yeah, so Todd, I guess kind of similar to what Jerry just commented on, looking at the other agencies you gave us all cities, and I'd like to know what counties are doing. Um, yeah. on it. They're, okay. lower. they're lower. There's, there's, a, yeah. there's no doubt that there's, when you go to the academy, there's an attraction that, you know, some people want to be in more urbanized areas. Some people would rather be a more rural and a county right. sheriff. And so those, and that's, that's the market. So in those folks that have a preference to be in the county, it's maybe a different scale than you're dealing with. If you're trying to get somebody that, you know, is coming from a city or would rather work in the city. But again, I'm not a, I'm not taking issue with the sheriff about wanting ten thousand. I'm just putting on a non sheriff hat and saying in in these budget times, let's see let's see what seventy five up to seventy five hundred dollars. The only trouble with up to if if I'm aware and I'm applying for a job that it's up to ten thousand dollars, you know what I'm going to ask for? Right, you're going to ask for the full amount. Exactly. And then we re renegotiate uh, salaries, then everybody's looking for that too. So, um, right. yes, I, I would like to, I, I don't want to commit to this until I see what other counties are doing and, and know for sure. Okay. We, there is, you know, the additional consideration on this is we believe that the jurisdictions hardest hit by um, a loss of COVID related revenues, loss of sales tax, are going to be cities. 
And so we think a lot of the jobs that are at risk are people who are currently working in cities, probably working in those urbanized environments. Um, and so we think that's the market. And we're, we're thinking that they probably want to go to a relatively urbanized area as well. That's why Spokane, just because of its situation, probably is an easier jump than going from, say, King County or a city of Seattle or city of Tacoma to a Soton County. I don't, <laughs> I don't think right. that's probably where they're going to choose to take their families. But I think we're also seeing a, you know, I, I will say, you know, in Seattle, they've, they've definitely reduced the amount of salary or the money that they're putting to the police department. So, and it's right. not because of reduction in sales tax. It's, it's both. Yeah, yeah it, it's both. It's so, both. I mean, so I think we, we will see this, you know, and so I think we may see more people jump and I, I don't know that I'm 10,000. So again, right. that's what other counties are doing. Um, okay. I'd, I'd like to know that. We have someone working on that survey right now. Um, I will have them expedite and get those results back to you. Okay. Well, in the case of Seattle, though, I think, uh, I could be wrong, but I think social workers work for less than police officers do. Yeah. So there is a, there's a savings there as well. That might be right. Um, with regard to the police force and stuff. So yeah, until they find one of their tenants, that's a nice way. So. <laughs> We also, okay. we've also hired in the past, not so much maybe law enforcement officers, but you know, I always get a little bit nervous about trying to match the west side of the state or the west coast period. You know, we, we have a product to sell here that, that we can sell for a lot less. And with, if I, and I'm not a police officer, but, and Todd makes a very good point. If I was a Seattle police officer or a Portland police officer after what they went through, I wouldn't even be looking for a bonus. I wouldn't mind taking a $10,000 cut and pay to get out of there and come here. So again, we don't know what we don't know. I agree with Todd. I think a lot of officers are going to be looking to go somewhere. What does that mean to us financially? I don't know. They will certainly take a cut and pay. <laughs> yeah, they'll take a cut and pay, that's for sure. This is like how, how Yakima recruited doctors. You know, they knew they had to have a Nordstrom's in Yakima for a long time before they were going to recruit <laughs> doctors. So you got to have a Nordstrom. So. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Thank Very you. Good. So we'll take this up again next week. Okay. I'll go to work, get some survey work done. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. You can you can call Tim, too, because they're doing a lot of work. I just couldn't bring it okay. up on my phone. Okay. Maybe we'll do it. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other? So we have... Uh, Duck Chase coming in at uh, 245. Uh, so we're. Oh, yeah, he is. Yeah, remember? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we can sit here and talk amongst ourselves, or we can take a break for 10 minutes and reconvene at 245. What would be your pleasure? Your mic. E either way. Yeah. I said, uh, can we get one of the executive sessions out of the way? Or is it they're going to take longer? Uh, we've got four of them. So once we roll into it, we'll just roll through all four of them. So really good so time. Was, uh, Doug is the first one so for uh, the executive, executive session. session. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner, we also might be good to entertain a motion to appoint the chair as oh. a member of the public defender uh, body. So some housekeeping items here uh, for the uh, 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 committee to find the new uh, uh, council, for council for defense. Uh, we need evidently a motion to appoint me or appoint one of you two uh, to that committee. So, uh, what would be the pleasure of uh, the body? Well, so I I did have one. I had one clarifying question. Do, does that body need to be assembled to appoint an interim? director yes it's both my opinion it and okay. Basios that it does okay all right uh I, then i had i had told you earlier when we talked i disagree with that but that doesn't make it so <laughs> that, I that's why question, that's why i asked i wasn't i wasn't gonna throw you under the bus jerry no, no, but no, this is no good but I, when i good. asked when i asked in the opinion i said it's not in the code that i can see and i was it was explained to me this could was it upset or 
I can't remember if this might upset someone. And when I asked who, I never got an answer. Okay. Who would this, who would this impact and upset if we didn't do it this way? Mm. And I never got an answer of who that is. If you guys just told me to appoint an interim or you, and we just said you well, fill in, the impact of doing that is what I'm trying to find just for my own education and the opinion, and I respect that. We think that you should do that because of why? Oh, is this appointing someone with, if they don't have the authority to be appointed and every act they did would be void, the women right. we would be in a situation where you might have to unwind a whole bunch of stuff. Right. Okay, well then, uh, oh, Mr. Sorry. Chair, I move to appoint um, the Chair of the Board of County Commissioners, Commissioner French, to serve on the uh, selection body for the uh, head of the Council for Defense, along with the um, representative from Superior Court and representative from the Bar Association. Well, I'll, I'll second that, but I've got questions. Okay, uh, I've got a motion and a second, Mary. So, because I think, isn't it in statute that it's, it is the chair and it's the president of the Bar Association and it's the presiding for Superior Court? Or is that just practice? Past practice. Past practice uh, has been that pra past practice, uh, Commissioner Cuny. Except the bar president is not always active. But it's my understanding from talking to Mr. Maceo, the history of this has been it's been the chair of the board of county commissioners. And Commissioner Kurtz mentioned when he was a chair a couple of years ago, he did that. And it's also been the presiding judge. I believe Judge Clark was on the panel with yeah. who is still the presiding judge with Commissioner Kurtz. And I know previously Judge Ellen Clark was on that panel a few years back with then Commissioner O'Quinn. So that's been the history, but it's not okay. required by statute. Could be any one of you three or any one of those 12 Superior Court judges. But the, the practice has been the chair and the presiding judge. Okay. I mean, I, I would like to just stay within the best practice, but, um, and then this is only to fill the, the remainder of this term. Yeah, yes, Commissioner Cuny, the term for the CFD person is the same term as Prosecutor Haskell and Public Defender Krasminski. So the, there may be an interest issue of an interim because Mr. Mason is leaving October 16th, so this committee would have to deal with that. And then that appointment would only be through the end of 2022 because that's when both Mr. Krasminski's and Mr. Haskell's terms end. Can they appoint an interim? Just, just let me yes, clarify that it's just... It's just for the remainder of the term. So, okay. Yes. Well, the well but, but but that the that body will have to get together more than once because they will appoint somebody for interim, and then they'll have to come together once people have submitted applications to fill out the remainder of the term, which is two years. So that there you you will, that body will actually take two votes, one for the short term and then one for the long term once people apply to fill out the, the final two years, correct? Commissioner Kearns, that is not uh, required by the statute. However, as a practical matter, that's very likely. Uh, okay. In theory, the, if, if there's one candidate the three members agree on that's there on and before them on the interim uh, basis, they could forego the interim and just to make the appointment. The okay. high probability, given the time frame, and given everything is that it will be as you say, but this is a shorter procedure. So they're not legally required to that. I've suggested strongly to the human resource director that he give those options in terms of an agenda that, you know, interim appointment or full appointment discussion as to whether you're going to call for uh, applicants, that sort of thing. And that's purely up to the three members though, but high probability it's exactly like you say. It's just not technically required. Thank you. Any more discussion on the motion? Okay, all those in favor, please indicate me saying aye. 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 Aye, let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Okay, any other miscellaneous items that you wanna deal with before we go into executive session? So I'm assuming Mr. Chase is on his way over. They're gonna send him as soon as he walks Oh, over. here he is. Look at that. Good Look at that. Oh, All right. <laughs> so the board is going to go into executive session 
to discuss four issues. The first will be um, uh, a pending or potential sale, lease, or acquisition of uh, real estate. And for that executive session will be our senior management team, as well as Mr. McClain. You can stay. Okay. Yeah. And Mr. Doug Chase. Uh, second item, uh, our, our, uh, those next two items are pending a potential litigation, and that will include our senior management team and uh, Ms. McClain. And third item will be evaluation of individual for public employment. That will include our senior management team. And, uh, well, you might as well stay for that one too, because you'll have the fourth one, SRTC. And then the fourth one is um, uh, pending potential litigation. All four of these um, executive session items should take place within an hour's period of time. Uh, if, however, uh, we should uh, have to extend, we will do that um, uh, in public. Um, and no decision is anticipated to be made as a result of the executive session, but if that should change, uh, decisions will also be made in open public forum. So with that, then it is now uh, 2.43 and we'll be moving into executive session as soon as we shut down the electronics. When we're done with the executive session, we will not reconvene, but we will be adjourned for the rest of the day.